afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the afternoon sessions. I hope everybody enjoyed the bark. We were just talking about whether we should have had some thrash metal or something to start, but we, we don't. Um, so I, 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 I'm not going to be... I, I'm, I'm, my name is sort of associated with continuous delivery. I should warn you ahead of time, I'm not really talking about continuous delivery today. So if you're expecting any of that stuff, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about reactive systems. I had the privilege to be involved in one of those kind of once-in-a-career sort of projects um, uh, uh, about 12 years ago, uh, and, and we, we started building what turned out to be one of the world's highest performance financial exchanges, and this was a difficult problem. It was, it was a very challenging problem, which we didn't know how to solve when we started. So we started doing some really quite engineering kind of things and trying to figure out how to do this stuff. To cut a long story short, what came out of this was an idea that, that we started afterwards talking about as reactive systems, and, and, and we, we did some fairly innovative things in terms of architecture on that project. And, uh, and reactive systems is one of those ideas that I think is time, if, if I'm honest, its time has not yet come. It's used in some niche areas, but there's some, I think there's some really valuable ideas in here, and I want to just try and go through that. Quite a lot of this stuff is sort of, um, it's not theoretical, this is all practical and, and, and true, but I'm going to talk about it sort of from at the design level, I'm not going to be talking about code level things very much. Um, I've also got quite a lot of territory to cover, so there's quite a lot of stuff to get through, and I'm, not quite, I'm going to do my best to cover that, and I'm not quite sure how much time there's going to be for questions. Please, though, do send in the questions through the app. I'm going to be here for the rest of the week, so if you see me and you, you have any questions that come out of this, just come and talk to me about it. I'll be here at the end of the presentation, we talk about that. If we don't get to cover uh, pres uh, the questions that come in the app, I'll try and put them on Twitter or, or, or a blog post or something like that and try and answer all of the questions. But, uh, so please don't hold back on the questions. Uh, but let's, let's start. So I think one of the things that's evident is, 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 that, is, that, is that our world is changing, our world as, as technologists. Um, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, a large application you would characterize as having tens of servers, seconds of response times, hours of, uh, of offline maintenance and gigabytes of data. That's not big anymore. That's kind of almost a toy application. Uh, these days, we're talking about thousands of, of multi-core systems, distributed systems, handheld devices, millisecond or faster response times, 100% uptime, and petabytes of data. That's not been all, of the, all that unusual. And so that should be challenging the way that we're thinking. I, I, I've, I've, I am old enough and have been doing this long enough to be, 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 uh, feel comfortable in being a grumpy old man, and being and, and, and so and so you know, our industry doesn't change as quickly as we think it does, but from time to time, big changes happen, and I think there are some that are on that are on the horizon, some further ones that are on the horizon. One simple way of looking at the way that, uh, which things have changed, though, is just to look at kind of the density of, of storage. Um, up here are some pictures of some different storage things. Uh, in the top left-hand corner, the, 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 thing, the thing behind the, the SD card there is a thing called a ferrite core memory board. Um, I actually had one of those. My wife threw it out by accident. So it was before me. That's, that's kind of prior to my generation. So this is kind of 60s technology sort of thing. This is, this is actually the sort of stuff that was in the, in the space shuttle and because it, it was durable. They, 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 these things didn't break very much. But, but, the, but the low density. So each one of those little magnetic rings is a bit. <laughs> Sat on top of it is an 8 gigabit store storage. It's, this has changed. Just here, the difference between 2005 technology and 2014 technology, we went from 128 megabytes to 128 gigabytes uh, on those sorts of things. So, so the hardware is changing quite dramatically. And I think we don't really realize that. I, there's, there's, a, there's an amusing quote that the biggest, um, the biggest uh, achievement of the software industry was to... Uh, slow down hardware, <laughs> uh, and, and there's kind of truth. You know, we, we've got these amazing, staggeringly, fabulously powerful machines, 
and we run JavaScript on them on the server side. And in, the ki- in the kinds of environments that I worked in, that, that, that sort of doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's hard to get your head around just how staggeringly amazing the hardware that our software runs on really is. And so I just wanted to go through a little exercise to try and demonstrate that. Let's for a moment imagine that instead of three nanoseconds or so, um, a, 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 a CPU cycle was one second. How would that play out if that's, if that's what was going on? So we've got one CPU, one CPU cycle. In reality, it's a third of a nanosecond. Let's imagine in our world it's going to be one second. So modern CPUs, the transistors, we couldn't make them go faster, but we could add more transistors. So the trans- transistors density has gone up, you've got to do something with those transistors, so we put loads of memory onto the chips. So the caching in modern chips is, is really quite efficient. That's the, that's the most efficient storage in, in our computers, the level one cache. The registers in the, in the processor, first of all, then the level one cache is the most efficient. A level one cache hit takes 0.9 nanoseconds, or in our world, three seconds. A level two cache hit takes nine seconds. A level three cache hit, this is all still on the chips, this is all still on the processor, takes 43 seconds. Now we're getting into the territory where we've got to go off the chip. So if the, if the stuff that we want to process is not in the cache on the chip, we've got to go to main memory. That's going to take the equivalent of six minutes. If we wanted to do computer-computer, say to over 10 meters over fiber, so pretty fast, that's going to take 18 hours. If we wanted to access data on a solid-state disk, fast, right? Solid-state disks are, are, are really efficient. That would take four days. If we wanted to access some spinning rust on a more conventional hard disk, that's going to take six months. If we wanted to send a message from internet, from, across the internet from London to Australia, that's going to take 19 years. And if we wanted to reboot our computer and restart Windows, <laughs> that's going to take 31,000 years. Our systems are staggeringly powerful. So, and yet our software doesn't really feel like it's very much faster. In some senses, it's probably slower than some of the software that we made back in the olden days where com- computers were, no ne- were nowhere near as, as efficient as this. When we started building our exchange, we had some staggeringly difficult kind of performance thresholds to meet. And so we started digging into this and, and, and finding out. And we kind of came fairly, we, we did lots of experimentation, we did lots of measurement, lots of benchmarking of different conven- conventional sorts of approaches. We started off not just assuming things. So we, we started off, well, you know, relational databases are not, you know, easy to use, so maybe, could we do, would it be possible to push a relation? Not even close. So, so, so we, it started challenging our thinking about the kind of architecture that we could build. To cut a long story short, the kind of elev- elevator pitch for, uh, for, for reactive systems and the reactive manifesto, which I got involved in, in, in authoring sometime afterwards, is that 21st century problems are not really best solved with 20th century software architectures. And yet, I think that most of us, most people starting most systems, still to this day, you know, you kind of say, okay, so I'm going to pick my language, I'm going to pick my web, web technology, I'm going to pick my relational database, now what's the problem again? But, the, but that's, that's not really what we're talking about. There, there are more options than that. Um, the reactive manifesto, to, to, to summarize, oops, sorry, click too, ahead, too quickly ahead. The, the reactive manifesto kind of summarized the, these, these, these kinds of style of systems as saying, first, that they are responsive. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to stay being able to be responsive to, to demand, whatever that means. They're resilient in the, in the, under stress. That means that they stay being responsive even when they're being stressed. They're elastic. They're able to scale up and scale down. And all of those ideas are kind of underpinned by them being message-driven. So that's the sort of stuff that those are the sorts of systems that we're talking about and exploring. Uh, and as I said, we came up with some kind of we came to some fairly unusual conclusions, and I sort of want to walk you through that that discovery process a little bit as part of my talk today. So the reactive systems they they respond in a timely manner. They're the cornerstone of you. That's the cornerstone of usability, and it means that they're very quick to dis, to, to to detect problems. 
They're resilient in the face of failure. That depends on replication, containment, isolation, and delegation. But fun, the resilience is kind of the core principle that we're trying, to, we're trying to hit with these sorts of systems. They're elastic. They remain responsive under varying workload. They respond to change in the input by increasing or decreasing the resources to, uh, to, to keep that responsiveness. And they, tend, they are decentralized. It's, this is a naturally decentralized kind of architecture, which means that it limits the number of contention points and, and removes sort of centralized bottlenecks. This is a kind of naturally distributed uh, kind of software architecture. They're message-driven, and, and, and not just message-driven in the sense that uh, a REST API or something like that. These are asynchronous message-driven systems. And the asynchrony is important, and, and we're going to get into that as well. They're loosely coupled. Isolation, location transparency, that gives us the ability to kind of scale these things up and down and, and gives us an in, a bunch of interesting properties. It means also that we can kind of delegate errors and that we can almost willy-nilly destroy parts of the system and still make progress in other parts of the system. So some, here are some of the properties that, 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 we, that, we, that we kind of shot for in the architecture, but also observed. They're flexible, they're loosely coupled, scalable. Arguably, and I'm going to try and make the points to you, they're easy, easy to develop. I, I was at a a kind of weird architects conference uh, a couple of months ago, and there was, we were talking about some of this stuff. And there were some people in the audience that had kind of built re reactive systems. And one of them, I was on a panel, and one of the guys said, "Could you have a show of hands of people that build reactive systems? Hands up, those people that thought they were easier to build." And everybody put their, except me, put their hands down. So that's that's questionable, but I think that they are, and I'll try and explain why I think that's true. Um, they're more tolerant of failure for sure. They respond to failure gracefully, and I'm, we're going to talk about that as well, and they re retain this responsiveness to users that we're looking for. Um, when we start talking about these sorts of things, of asynchronous systems and message passing and all this sort of stuff, if you're anything like me, you're just painting, in your, painting in your head is probably sort of big kind of enterprise style, things like that. But there's more to it than that. I would kind of argue that, that, that the sorts of patterns, the sorts of things that we're talking about, there's something kind of fundamental, almost like sort of fundamental physics in, but in our world about the nature of these kinds of systems. Large systems are generally composed of smaller ones and, 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 and the, the, the kind of the, the reactiveness of these systems kind of goes all the way down. What I'm trying to say is that this is kind of fractal. And one way of looking at this is, is you can kind of look at the way that the hardware works again. If you look at the, the architecture of a modern CPU, whatever the nature of the CPU, if it's multi-core, it's asynchronous and bus-based. It's, it's, it's based on a series of message passing and well-defined protocols to maintain this uh, thing. I was in a, one of the presentations this morning uh, where uh, Ken was talking about um, uh, event-based systems and somebody asked the question about... Uh, how do you keep these? What about the problem of the latency of these event based systems? Event based systems are not slower, they're faster because you do less work. So I'm going to go into that as well and explain what I mean by that. So let's start thinking about the way that some of these things work. So here's, here's a nice little picture of component A and component B. And let's imagine that we've got a synchronous message uh, joining the two. So we're going to invoke some behavior on component B, which is, which is composed with component, B, uh, component A, which is composed with component B, so we're going to call component B. Now, what can, what can component A know if something goes wrong? It can know that it's got a bug, bug of it in its own place. That might, it might go wrong there. It might go wrong at the point at which it's trying to connect to some remote distant service. The message might be lost, the, the instruction might be lost in transit, uh, as, it trans uh, as it goes across the network. There might be a problem connecting to component B. There might be a bug in component B, and you've got the mirror of all of those points of failure on the way back as well. Now, which of those can component A know about? Just those two. All of the rest, uh, and the third one, a bug, a bug in its handling of the response. Those are the only ones that component A can directly detect. That means that when we build distributed systems, we've got this horrible explosion of complexity of all of these other failure cases that can occur that we don't really have proper information about. 
So that adds a lot of complexity. There's another way in which uh, synch synchronous uh, interactions uh, uh, make complexity. So synchronous communications increase coupling in both lo location and time. If we've got all of this stuff and we're making a call to the other thing, that thing's got to be there until, we get on, until pretty much it's sent the answer back. If it's not there when we send it, we're stalled. So, if we've got, a, you've got, you've got an iteration with component A, and that triggers some, com some behavior in component A, which then is going to result in us dip calling on to component B, like this, what are we going to do in component A? Component A has got to sit still until component B is finished. It's not too bad if you've got two pieces, but what that means is if you're building a large system, your system is constrained on the slowest part, always, as long as it's synch synchronous. How do you cope with it? What that means is that it's blocked, in effect. In component A, he's stalled until it gets an answer back from component B. How do you cope with that? Classically, what we tend to do is that we say, oh, well, we'll make it multi-threaded. We'll, we'll, we'll make that component multi-threaded so we can service operations while we're waiting for the result of previous operations. And now we've just added one of the most complicated things in computer science into the middle of our domain logic, the, the management of multi-threaded and, con uh, and concurrent pr programming. Um, and there's still, there's still a limit. So we kind of, when we were building our exchange, we kind of went down this, this, a version of this route, and we built, some, we built something called a staged event-driven architecture. And in staged event-driven architecture, the idea is, is that you have kind of thread affinity. Every interaction with a particular resource, your account or a particular marketplace or something like that, is always serviced on the same thread. And so what that means in those sorts of architectures is that as, any, as a request comes in, you've got to identify the nature of the request and figure out which thread is it supposed to, supposed to be played on, so some, some kind of hashing algorithm or something or other to figure out where to put it. We built one of those, and we measured its performance, and it absolutely sucked. We'd worked out that we needed to be able to, we, we needed to, be able to do a minimum of 100,000 messages a second with less than one uh, millisecond response time. We were seeing about 10,000 messages a second with one millisecond response time for m most of them and about 10 seconds response time for a significant tiny proportion, uh, which was rubbish. There was no good in, in our scenario. So we started scratching our heads. So we started profiling our system and trying to figure out what went on. We worked out that we were spending more than 100 times more CPU cycles figuring out where to do work than we were doing work. So we said, that's stupid. Let's put all of the work on one thread and then make no choice. <laughs> so there's, no, there's now no concurrency. So you could do that. You could, you could, you could build, uh, sorry, there's one more step is that the, as, the, as the system gets more complicated, if you're using synchronous calls, the, 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 the complexity kind of breeds, it kind of explodes. So if we were to approach this uh, differently, if we were to approach this and say, well, let's do this synchronously instead, we're going to make a call to component A, we're going to call component B, and as soon as that call is comp complete, component A is free to, to work on something new. When it gets the response back, sometime in the future, might be the next microsecond, might be three days, we don't care, um, it's going to respond to that. To that, to that. What does that give us in terms of failure modes? Well, as before, we've got all of the same kind of points of failure. We could lose messages, the system might not be there, and so on. But from component A's point of view, the places that it can detect the local failures are under its control, and everything else it doesn't care about, as long as eventually the message comes back. If I, let's say the data center that component B is running it was hit by an asteroid, uh, and the message is kind of, we've sent the message, we build a new data center, we populate it with servers, we press the button to deploy all of our software in the servers, the message arrives, is processed, and it sends a response back to component A. Component A doesn't care, it's still going to process the event. 
So it gives us a way of kind of ignoring a whole bunch of failure scenarios in the context of any particular component of the system. That's quite a nice property. This starts to sound complicated, though. And the re I think partly the reason why it sounds more complicated is because we are kind of culturally aligned with synchronous programming. I would bet that everybody in the room, the first one of the first things that you ever wrote in, in code that involved a function call was a synchronous call of some kind. You made a call, you waited for that call to finish before moving on and doing some more execution. We, that's not really, very, if you think about it, that's not really a very natural way to think about things. If, 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 I, if I speak to you and I ask you a question, my brain doesn't freeze and stop <laughs> until you answer me. You still haven't answered, I haven't asked you a question, but if I were to, you still haven't answered me. I'm not static, I can carry on processing, I can carry on thinking other things, I can start thinking. The real world is asynchronous. The real, the universe is an asynchronous thing, it's not a synchronous thing. Synchronicity is kind of a fake thing that we layer on top of it to try and make our lives easier. And then when we get to more complicated, particularly distributed and concurrent systems, it kills us because it makes it more complicated, not less. Well, one of my friends who was involved in building the exchange, Martin Thompson, says that he reckons that synchronous programming is the crack cocaine of programming. It's kind of alluring, <laughs> it's Moorish, but it's bad for you. So, if we were to do this with, with asynchronous messages, instead we could send a message to component A, that sends it to component B, it's done. We could send another message. To com sometime later, component B sends a response. All is good. If it fails, that's okay. We can kind of understand that locally in component A, and we can kind of cope with it uh, when we get a message back in response in component B, but we separate the, the, the request from the response in the messages. If we make these single-threaded, it makes the code that we write in each of these pieces simple. It also counterintuitively makes it dramatically higher performance. We got involved in, we, we, we ended up coming up with an idea that was called mechanical sympathy, which was, which was about trying to write your code in a way that took advantage of the mechanical properties, the physical properties of the hardware underneath you. And we, wrote, we, we ended up, our, our exchange was one of the highest performance exchanges in the world as a result of this kind of line of reasoning and of measuring these things and understanding the impact of the design choices. Single-threaded is not slower. And the reason is, is because if you do work in parallel on two things, which obviously sounds like a good idea, there is no way that we know of in computing of joining those two pieces of work together again in terms of shared state. That doesn't cost orders of magnitude more than the effort that it takes to do the work. Even if you do the, the fastest way of doing this, like sort of using the low-level concurrency features built into modern chips, compare and set, and those sorts of ideas, it's still orders of magnitude slower than just doing it on one thread. So you have to be in the game of having an algorithm that is, can support hundreds or thousands of um, uh, parallel processes before you get an advantage over the, what, the work that you can do on a single thread. That's kind of a weird idea. That's an, an idea that's, that, that's not where we've been led to think about in, in, in the direction in which computer science has been evolving uh, over the last few years. As computers have got, as we kind of hit the heat limit, uh, 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 and so gigahertz weren't, weren't going up in our CPUs, we've been adding more and more cores and more and more parallel execution. That's all wonderful and fine, as long as, long as you never need to join the results together. Mostly, if we're building software, in a, in a single system, at some point we need to join the results together. So, uh, we've got these, these, the, these events coming in. We're going to send some events out in response. And we're going to kind of process those on a single thread. And we'd like to be able to do that as efficiently as possible, uh, certainly in high performance systems. If you follow this line with high performance systems, the levels of performance that you can get is really quite staggering. Uh, our system could produce literally millions of, uh, of, of transactions a second, 
uh, and it was it was processing them in in, in microseconds. So so the the edge of our network, two network hops, trans evaluating a match in a matching engine in the exchange, two network hops back out to the edge of our network took 40 microseconds. That was kind of world class at the time. The problem is, is, that, is that you need to then start thinking about what the, the nature of the algorithm is a little bit different. So here's, here's, here's an example of one of the patterns that kind of, that kind of cropped up for us. And the, we use this pattern over and over again. Essentially, so, so okay, so if, if I'm going to just process this thing and then I'm going to send off a, a message, how do I kind of... That leaves me in a weird state because I, I, because I, because I haven't got a response back yet. And, and how do I make progress from there on? You kind of build it as a sort of state machine. So you have these messages and state machines. So here's a little example. Let's imagine we've got a bookstore, and we're going to place an order for a continuous delivery book. If we're doing that synchronously, and, and the bookstore is then going to call into the warehouse or wherever, check the inventory, and, and see whether you've got a book to sell. So you're going to reserve continuous delivery in the, in, in the inventory. And the book, one way of writing, the synchronous way of writing the algorithm is that at the point at which you get the order for the book, you sit there and you wait until the inventory is being checked before you respond. So you can certainly build a system like that, but for all of the reasons that we just described, it's a bit fragile. What we could do instead is that we could do this asynchronously. asynchronously. So we're going to place an asynchronous order for the book, and we're going to change the, st we're going to call, call reserve on the inventory. Sometime later in the future, we're going to get a response back from the inventory saying that the book has been reserved, uh, sorry, it's been, been ordered. And then we can go back to the user and say that it's been ordered. All this sounds slow and, and so on. I want to keep reminding you that this isn't slower because we're doing less work. We're not having to, we're not having to do thread manipulation and all that kind of stuff and store threads. We're doing, well, this, is, this is just running kind of natively free. In, in, in each of the processes. We're using the processes efficiently. But there's a problem in terms of what the model's going on here. So another way of thinking about this is that each of these little services is, it represents a state machine. So you're going to place the order for the book, and we're going to change the state of the book in, in, in the, 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 the understanding of the bookstore to we're in reserving state. And then we're going to generate the reserve, the, the reserve event, and the, the, sometime later, we're going to respond. But we could have another order. We could have an order for a different book happening in parallel with this. So maybe there's an, or, a, 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 an order for a different book. And the bookstore can, order, can, can, can process this on a single thread without having to have finished the ordering of the first book. Sometime later, the inventory comes back. back doesn't necessarily need, need to be in order. We can change the state of the books that were ordered and so on. So the system can make progress. That would be true even if the inventory was down. The, the, the bookstore could still make process. It could still process orders. They would be in the reserving state rather than in the ordered state. And if we hadn't been able to you know, process those you know, sometime in the future, you know, if, if it was an hour later or something and we're worrying about those, we could have a process that looked for things that were stuck in the reserving state and have something. But the programming around all of that is relatively simple and straightforward. We're just talking about one event in, one event out. One event in, one event out, all of the time. The services as state machines is a really nice pattern. It, it, it seems to crop up over and over again when you start building systems like this. At least it did for us. It's very simple. And the thing that's interesting is that nearly all of the, the complexity that you're interested in is kind of domain level, not technical level. We're not interested in kind of the weird, fa weird failure scenarios. We're, we're interested in, is the book in an ordered state or a reserved st reserving state? That's kind of a domain level principle. So we can kind of focus on the essential complexity of the problem rather than the accidental complexity of it running a, 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 as part of a computer system. It allows us to migrate the state of a durable domain model based on these messages. Each time a message comes in, it changes the state of the domain model in some way, generates a message on the way out, and so we've got a, a record of this, uh, of this going on. Um, <clears throat> that's quite nice, particularly when you start thinking about what you could do with that sequence of events, because you could record those events, and then you could play them back, and you could, you could reliably get the system back into a deterministic state. The sequence of the events, um, as long as you've got the log of events, is the truth. 
It means you need to think about the properties of the ways in which you get the events between the services and all that sort of stuff, and we'll talk a little bit about that kind of thing. If all of that's making you feel about, a bit nervous, what I've just described is the way that a relational database is implemented. It, that's how they work inside. They maintain a transaction log and a sequence of steps. This is not new, new. This is not a radically weird way of doing things. This is the way that serious systems do serious things. We just kind of invert it a bit and surface, separate out the concerns in a slightly different way. Just to kind of, just kind of elaborate on that a little bit more. We've got an event coming into the bookstore, order the CD book. We're going, to pass, we're going to do some processing on that of some kind, change the state of the CD book to ordering, delegate that to the inventory and say, reserve the book, please. That's going to do some processing, uh, change the state of the book to reserved. Send a message back saying, your book's reserved. That will arrive whenever it is. If the bookstore's down, it will wait and it will be delivered when the bookstore comes back up and so on and so on. That can do some processing, say, change the state of the CD book to ordered, and it can kind of push that back out again. So there's nothing really very hard going on here, but it does start to ask, so if the system, go, if the inventory goes down and all of that stuff doesn't work, Sometime later, we can kind of build, rebuild our data center. We could list the, 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 we could list the, the books that are in stuck in the ordering state and decide, decide some sort of business logic that's going to process them and, and, and send some messages, do some admin action or something or other. Uh, or we could kind of wait until the inventory comes back up if it's quick uh, and re, you know, resubmit the message that had been sent but was stuck in transmission. Uh, and change the state and back to the same uh, flow that we were talking about before. So I, this is kind of part of my argument that this is simple. Remember, all of this is happening on a single thread. Now, it's, it's asking some things of the infrastructure. It's asking some things of the, the delivery of the messages. If we want to be able to do this kind of durable things, it means we need the messaging to be, to be, to be fairly durable and fairly reliable. Um, we need to be confident that our messaging is going to retain order. It's going to be, we need our states to be deterministic. That means that each of these services can only be mutated via a message. There are no back doors. There's nothing else that's coming in. There's nothing else that's going to change the state of our service. Only we, we, the only way that we change that state is via a message. And, uh, and we need these things to be durable. We need, we need these, 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 these properties of the communication between the services to be in place and happening uh, um, all of the time. Just to put, I, I'm not suggesting that you should know or care about this level of stuff uh, in order to be able to build systems like this, but just to kind of put your mind at rest, I just, I'm just going to kind of lift the, the, the covers on the next layer down to show you that you could build something like this. This is the messaging system that we built. We used a thing called a disruptor, which was based on having a large ring buffer to buffer in, uh, messages between stuff. Those things were, the infrastructure was be processing messages on other threads away from the business logic. So we'd have our component A, it would... It would, um, in our ring buffer uh, here, where are we? Sorry. That's not working. That little tiny yellow arrow up there, we've got a cursor on the ring buffer that says where we're going to place a message. When component A makes a message, it's going to put that and it's going to pop the message in a slot in the ring buffer. And then we're going to populate messages that way. Come on, click. Right, so it's going to pop those things. And then sometime later, on a different thread, divorced from the need of the, the thing that's emitting the messages to coordinate, when the, when the communications thread wakes up, it's just going to process messages out of the ring buffer, put them all across the network, send them across the network. Those messages are going to arrive in the, the, the input ring buffer on the, other, on the other computer. And that too is going to maintain a cursor into those messages. I think, my, uh, I think my point has gone dead. Or my computer's gr grinding to a halt, one or the other. So we can kind of carry on sending messages. If we lose a message in transmission, each of these messages has a unique ID. We, it knows which slot it's supposed to go in. And so if the message, if we've sent message four and component B is expecting message three, it can say, 
No, I was expecting three. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to knack that. I'll say, I was expecting three. And so then, then the component resends message three. So that's the knack. So, we, so next, next time when it gets the knack, we could carry on filling up the ring buffer. That's okay because we've still got separate cursors. But now we're going to resend three, four, five, and catch up. I think in principle, I hope that you would agree that if you built something like that, you, you'd get fairly reliable messaging. You'd be able to get the kinds of properties that I was talking about of having kind of long-lasting durability. That, that's the thing that we built, and we built, we built some open source software called the Disruptor to kind of manage the ring buffers and kind of keep the speed up. When you start putting all these things together, what this starts to do is it starts to decoupling the services in time and space. We don't care where the other service is, where the inventory is. When the new one comes up, it could come up on a different continent. As long as we can get the message to it, the behavior is going to be the same. That means that we can start doing clever things. It means that we can start allocate, you know, doing smart things in the, in the routing of the messages. It means that we're sharing nothing. Uh, we, we, we're going to aim to ensure that each of these little services is a discrete bubble of behavior. And it's not dependent on anything else other than via the messages and the message protocols. And that means that we need to start taking seriously designing the, the protocol of the, the, the exchange of information between the, the messages seriously. If this is reminding you of microservices, that's good because that's a similar kind of pattern in very many ways. It's not necessarily the same thing, but it certainly has a lot of uh, similarities. And the best way of bounding these kinds of services is certainly in the same way as with microservices along bounded, bounded contexts uh, within the problem domain. But the isolation is kind of interesting. So, if we got, like microservices, if we were writing two services and they're sharing a database in eight microservices, if you're doing that and it's not a reactive system, you need, you need these things to, be, to own their own storage. So this is not an effective pattern. So each of the services is responsible for its own storage where that's appropriate. So here's, here's a couple of services. Let's imagine we've got some, uh, the, the, the storage becomes part of the component. Uh, and that means that you know, if we need a graph database in one service and a relational database in another service, absolutely fine. But there's also some, some other options that kind of crop up, which is kind of interesting. The boundary of the service is the boundary of the service. And actually, all of the information that, de de that, that describes the state of the service is deterministic because we've already defined the properties of the message exchange as being in order, uh, order preserving sequence of delta changes. In effect, that's what the mes these asynchronous messages are. So we've got, if we're to think about that, we've got a message coming into component A. We could get, let it go into component A and allow component A to store it somewhere. And then there's a message coming out. But we could also do this instead. We could treat component A as a black box. There's a message coming in, we're going to, and there's a message going out. We could treat that as a black box. We just worry about the domain logic inside that server because that's the stuff that's really important. And then as the message comes in, We could divert it, and we could just write the log, just write the message to some more persistent store. If something bad happened to the service, when we start the new version, copy of the service up, we just replay the messages from the persistent store, logically from the beginning of time. We replay all of this, and the, the, this component gets precisely back into the same state that it was before. Think about what that means for a moment. One of the beautiful characteristics of the exchange that we built was that we could replay production events in a, in, in a test environment and get into this uh, uh, system in a test environment into precisely, identically, reproducibly the same state as it was in production and have a, have a break point on it so to be able to debug what was going on. 
Um, it means that when you're developing these things, you can make all of this stuff infrastructural. This is kind of generic. If you're starting working at the level of messages, they're just sort of stuff that you can kind of write out and store and replay generically at, at the level of messages. That means that when you're writing one of these services, the only thing that you need to think about is the domain logic. Again, we're in this game where we've completely separated the essential complexity of the problem domain from the accidental complexity of all of the computer gubbins that, gu gubbins that surrounds it. We can kind of move the computer gubbins, that, all of those things, into the infrastructure more. Now, this might sound like the return of the 1980s and, or 90s and uh, enterprise service buses and all that sort of stuff. And I don't mean that kind of stuff. The infrastructure is kind of fairly lightweight and fairly simple in some respects. But with some restrictions on our programming, it means we can focus more on the problem domain and less on the kind of computer science that surrounds it, as long as we have that infrastructure. If we want to do the same thing with, 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 with clustering, we can do the same thing. We can record the events. We can replay them into different places and have have a clustered system where we've got two ident identically stateful models of the system in, in two different places. We, we use this as part of our failure modes. The core of our system, the system of record for our, uh, for our exchange in the very high performance parts of the exchange was the in-memory state of the stateful domain models which is kind of a really nice programming model, I think, as long as you kind of take some of the constraints of the asynchronous programming model. We then get onto back pressure. We in, in reactive systems, we talk about the resilience and all that sort of stuff. And the, the big problem is that you can't isolate stress. The system as a whole re really needs to respond sensibly when it's, un when it's under stress. Uh, and this is particularly true when we start thinking about these, these sort of flows of information and messaging and data through the system. Uh, so, when you start talking about distributed systems in, in, in general, the ideas of queuing crop up all over the place. And one of the things that never occurred to me until we started working on some of this sort of stuff is that if you think about it, queues are always an unstable state. They're either always full or always empty. The idea of them being balanced is kind of this weird kind of you know, anomaly that's never going to happen. What do I mean by that? Here's my two components again. And let's imagine that component A is slightly slower than component B. The message queue between them is always going to be empty on, on, on any kind of statistical measure. That's, you know, that's, uh, that's okay. That's, 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 not, that's not too bad a model. The other way around, though, <laughs> let's imagine that component A is slightly faster than component B then what's going to happen is that component B is going to be processing things, but component A is going to be filling up the queue. At some point, the queue is going to be full. And in this sort of world, the, components, the, the queue is always going to be full. We could do some stuff where component A backs off and all that kind of stuff. But the queue is essentially always few, full. This is an unstable state. The idea of the queue being kind of evenly loaded is just this kind of weird sort of one-off chance in, in a million compared to it's either always full or always empty. And this has kind of catastrophic effects. What does component A do when the queue's full? Usually what we do is fall over. <coughs> but we can, we, the, f the first couple of times it falls over, we might start thinking about something else. The usual response is to make the queue bigger. <laughs> uh, that doesn't work. It, that just defers the point at which the component A blows up and we drop messages on the floor. So never, ever, 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 never, ever use unbounded queues. So we've got to find a way of constraining the length of the queues. And so the only response that we, the only logical response that we can kind of follow is to start to apply back pressure. So at the point at which we're starting to approach the queue being full, we've got to signal we, there is no way at all that component A can do anything. There's nothing that it can do that's going to make this a survivable scenario other than throw messages away. I suppose that's one option. But if you want to keep the state, it can't do that. So the only thing that it can do in those circumstances is to signal upstream to say, I can't keep up, you've got to slow down. 
So we've got to record back pressure. And ultimately, that back pressure might need to go all the way out to the user in some way, and we've got to cope with it. But that's got to be part of the design response to be able to do this. So one of the properties that we would build into our kind of idealistic reactive systems infrastructure would be the support for back pressure to allow the messages to kind of signal the back pressure upstream and, and allow us to cope with those. Elastic systems need to react to changes on demand. And that, means, that means that when we send a message, we don't necessarily know where, who we're sending it to or where the, the location of where we're sending it to. Uh, and, and we're all doing this in distributed computing all of the time. Uh, and the idea is to embrace this. As soon as we're in distributed computing world, we're into the, 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 the realms of things like eventual consistency and cap theorem and all of those sorts of problems. And, and it's a genuinely hard problem. This is genuinely kind of world-class hard. There are no simple solutions. And that it's all about trade-offs. If you really, really need consistency between two components in, an, in, in, in a distributed system, uh, a distributed asynchronous system, there are exceedingly well-thought-out, proven models that allow you to do that. Things like RAFT uh, or... Um, uh, that, that allow you to kind of design an, an, a protocol of exchange that allows you to kind of manage the a distributed uh, consistency protocol. There's another kind of lighter weight thing that you can do, which is the thing that we did, which is you can kind of take, just assume that it doesn't, that the eventual consistency doesn't matter, and you can kind of build that into your system. Um, the other part of this, though, in terms of these, in terms of these, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself, and I'll come back to the eventual consistency thing. Um, the the other part of the uh, the facility of being able to move, separate out this essential complexity from the accidental accidental complexity is this idea of elastic scalability. So let's imagine that we've got some messaging going to component A. We can build our system like this at first. We've got some messaging, uh, and at some point, when when component B is too slow. Uh, and we'd like to be able to scale up, we could do this, and we could put into our messaging something that discriminates between the different kinds of messages in some way and filters them in different directions. Maybe all of the customer IDs that, that are under 10,000 go, go to the green one, and all the ones that are over 10,000 go to the yellow one, or whatever the algorithm is, something like that. It can be dumb. It can be just round robin, but we can kind of allocate behaviors between the different... Uh, the different components. When we start doing that kind of stuff, we start getting, we start ending up with these more complicated patterns. We've got these com com components talking to each other in a variety of different ways, and so on. Um, and some of these components might have store, more traditional stores where they are storing stuff in a d d database. Some of these might be these weird kind of in-memory state kind of things. Uh, that allow us to do uh, all sorts of clever things, and they're communicating in different directions with, with responses and all that kind of stuff. And the picture gets reasonably complicated, but I just want to remind you again, if you think about what's going on inside of each of these services, it's servicing a queue of messages coming in and generating a, an, an asynchronous output and, that's, and, and modifying the local state within the bounds of the service. That's it on a single thread. My experience of working on, the, on systems like this was, 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 was almost entirely joyful because it reminded me of the early days of learning to program when you were just writing code for yourself and you didn't have to worry about all of the horrible things of con concurrency and complexity of distributed programming. It just simplified the worldview. I haven't, got this, I haven't included the slide on eventual consistency. Let me just catch up with what I was talking about with eventual consistency. The other approach to eventual consistency, rather than the kind of distributed consensus protocols, is to start thinking about your problem domain. Does it really matter that the order history lags a little bit behind your current state of your orders? Not really. If you, if you design your system well, it doesn't matter because you're going to be looking at one thing in one place and another thing in another place, and whether they catch up microseconds later doesn't really matter very much. You're not going to be doing cross-validation cross, the, cross validation things. You can use your domain modeling to, 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 to take advantage or at least not get tripped up by eventual consistency uh, in that manner. Where you do need, the, you do need the, the, the consistency, then you use a protocol, something like Raft. And this is only the same as we would think about in a, in a distributed system. Distributed computing is 
complex. It's world-class complex. The problems that arise from distributed computing are always hard to solve. Distributed transactions don't really work, but that's the, that's the alternative solution. You know, distributed transactions are kind of a bit of a hack and they scare the hell out of anybody that sort of thinks about those because it's big and complicated, locks everything together. Raft is a mechanism of kind of doing distributed transactional in interaction or at least ensuring the consistency between things. So there are things that you can do. Uh, this is a picture of the, this is a high level kind of architect's arm wavy kind of picture of the, the, the LMAC system where we built our exchange. Just to try and call this out, we had the core services. These were the, these were the weird in-memory state kind of things. We had a bunch of general services. These were more traditional kind of microservice kind of things. And we had what we called gateway services, which were kind of translations. It would translate every interaction from the outside world into our, our native message system. This system has been going for more than 10 years, 12 years in fact, uh, and... He's still a nice system to work on, and he's still world-class in performance, and he's still an effective code base. So this is, this is uh, not as scary as it looks. Now, what I'd really like is to give you, so go and get this product and do this stuff. I don't think we're quite there yet. There's some stuff that's kind of along. Acker is probably the most mature things. The authors of Acker were the collaborators on writing the Reactive Manifesto with me and Martin Thompson. Uh, who, who works on the, the, the exchange that we're talking about. Uh, and there's some great stuff in, in, in ACA. This is based on actor patterns, if you come across those sorts of ideas. So look at, if you want to learn more about this stuff, read about actors and look at ACA. Aaron is, uh, is my friend Martin's and, and Todd Montgomery's uh, open source project for, it's the highest performance messaging system in the world. It's built on the, on, the, on the experience that we had at LMAX of this kind of infrastructure. And the, the, the destination for, is for it to do all of the things that we've talked about. They're adding bits of those things. Aeron is fabulous just as a message system. More than 7 million small messages a second. Nothing else comes close to touching it. But it can also do the kind of distributed... Um, uh, um, uh, per, uh, persistence of the messages and, 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 and so on that we talked about. There's some new stuff that's just come out very recently. So there's a, there's a, a product called Cloud State that looks interesting that I think I haven't, I haven't used it myself yet. I'm, I'm, I, it's on my list of things to play with. And just recently, I hadn't heard people talk about this, but this has been something that's in the back of my head for a while, is the idea of stateful services, uh, stateful serverless. If you think about what I've described, there's a, quite a lot of it sounds a bit like a serverless system in some ways, if only the server, serverless system was stateful. So you could build a slow version of that quite easily, where you're just getting the state out of S3 or whatever and but responding to the messages. But I think there's some really interesting work there. I have a suspicion that, the, uh, as I said at the outset, that we might be... I think that if the stateful services thing could hit... It might be one of these step changes. It might give us the opportunity to build systems on a different scale of complexity uh, than, than we are used to and kind of not worry so much about all of the kind of accidental complexity of building these things. So I think this is more in the, in the realm of something to watch out for than something to immediately jump on. But I would recommend it to you. It's a bit esoteric at the moment, but those organizations that I know that have practiced it would never go back to writing complex systems any other way because this is the nicest way of doing it. Thanks very much for your time. I have run out of time. I'm very sorry. I will take, any, I will take questions electronically. I'll be around here now during the coffee break, and I'll be around for the rest of the conference if you want to talk to me. Thank you very much.